Mr. Scott, that we were, I guess, maybe <laughs> that we can't call him Gus. But we were Inside talking. the actor's studio. <laughs> mm. Still have permissions with Gus. Uh, we were talking about uh, this this genre that won't die. And it's funny because to Sean's point. <laughs> no matter how true. many times we try to kill it. <laughs> we yeah, we try to fuck it ourselves a few times. But yeah, it's, it's a genre that it has... Uh, substantial merit because the songs were well written they were fun they were it was levity there was uh heart and soul went into it it wasn't just a matter of selling records it wasn't just what was anti-popular and popular with all the you know the nirvana and the whole grunge movement uh i i, I can never stand that stuff because it's like oh I, poor me i'm the poor little rich boy it's like you, you want to do this right but we, i think in our in our generation when we did this music we love we embodied it man like to your point it's like, like yahoo let's go right and it's fun to see these 20 year olds have that same mentality do you find that where you are my son brandon uh, he's 21 just turned 21 and he plays guitar now yeah, you know, you know, I even flew him out to one of our shows when he was younger and he saw the whole thing. We did a big show opening for Poison and the band Boston. So, you know, he got to see the whole thing firsthand. But he, I can't say he's a trickster fan, you know, and he doesn't know. But he knows Cherry Pie. He knows Guns N' Roses. He knows, and he's playing Led Zeppelin like crazy. So uh, a lot of it he got initially from Guitar Hero. Right. How they, you know, they, I, I don't know if everybody's familiar with what kind of discography is on there, but kids get the opportunity to play along to songs like Cherry Pie, to, you know, uh, Guns Roses, Welcome to the Jungle, and like a slew of other stuff. And then he gets involved, like, hey, what's up, boy? Let me go on YouTube and see what's going on. And then it links to another video and in, in that genre. And the genre blossoms in these kids. Right on. I've got a friend's band, uh, my buddy Dominic in Phoenix. He played uh, just last week at a local club. He had this little 14-year-old girl come up and play In My Dreams by Dockett. Nice. Oh, Where wow. the hell did a 14-year-old kid yeah. get that from? And yeah, how, yeah. Cool, how great is that? You know, that's like the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there is vehicle for the, it's It started to transcend generations. How is it doing that? I think a number of ways. Parents are one thing for sure. But the media, you know, like, like Guitar Hero, the culture is is nurturing that it's fostering that that blossom you know i think that's really cool you know it's funny you you, you talk about that because i remember growing up and dave and i joke about this we joke about it with some of our friends there would have been the metallica guys that would have been you know the middle of the summer when it's the sweltering heat they're wearing the rocker jackets and the leather and we're out there in the shorts and the hair all teased up but you know metal is hard to play but i defy anybody i'm a drummer mark we talked about this i defy anybody to go back and actually play those tunes properly they were not easy tunes to play your stuff included i mean a lot of people kind of go ah these guys were a bunch of clowns yeah a bunch of clowns that could play i mean you didn't get signed if you if you sucked right you know it's funny uh, and, and here here's an interesting argumentative point it's not that you have to be Eddie Van Halen on guitar to make, uh, you know, to, to, to write a great song. Uh, the, it's the songs that truly are the marketable item. You know, nothing beats a great song. Yeah. You, know? Uh, you know, you could be a whiz guitar, you could be a Neil Peart on drums, but if you can't, you know, the, the, the difference between just being Neil Peart and playing drums and playing Tom Sawyer. There, there, there's the, the ideal difference, yeah, you, yeah. you know what I mean? You, you, you got to have the music to back it up. And not just hits, you know, but hits certainly help. But some kind of credibility where people want to hear you play, where people want to hear you music. They want to hear what you're going to do next. They want to keep track when you come to town, you know. They want to sing along with those damn songs. It's really, that's, I mean, that, that's the reality of it. They don't want to just see a drum solo for an hour and a half, you know what I mean? I don't want to see a drum solo for an hour and a half. <laughs> so, you know, so, so, you know, talent is really somewhat secondary. Songwriting mm -hmm. talent, ah, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, there's some bands with more talent than others, but 
there's also some bands with a lot better songs than others. And I think there's something really to be said for that. You know, you don't have to be the best looking guy. You know, can it help get attention? Yeah. But your song ultimately, I think, is the thing that trumps it all. Well, and you talked about penis size earlier, too. That was important to you. You did mention that, too, right? Well, sure. I, at least when I measure my penis, if I use a legend <laughs> on a map, I'm at least 500 miles. So I'm very happy. That's, that's why Dave never had a great career. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you should pick up cartography. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's always that. Listen, this is about your point about being musicianship. Now, you can say this now, Gus. I'm calling you Gus because that's what I'm going to do from now on. The, the reality of it is, I mean, you had a lot of, of music background, a lot of theory. You went to school. I mean, uh, University of, uh, of uh, Hartford, if I remember correctly, right on your website today. So you're no slosh to the whole musicianship, and not just drums either, because Sean mentioned earlier, you have a trumpet album. I understand you're, you're a wicked guitar player as well. No doubt you play bass. Like I, 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 I am, so in fact, the worst guitar player in rock and roll. I oh, am. Oh. I, I swear to God, I, I am actually dubbing myself the worst guitarist in rock. I suck. <laughs> I got a great Les Paul, but it, I suck. <laughs> go go pick up your guitar, Dave, and prove him wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you guys are funny. Yeah, I mean, I'm, take, I'm, I'm classically trained. Uh, I can probably write better symphony music than I can rock and roll. <laughs> I wasn't one of the primary writers in Trickster. You know, I really wasn't. Uh, Steve was the primary. Pete helped out a lot. PJ helped out a lot also. I certainly was much farther down the scale. Uh, as far as contribution uh, musically and songwriting sense, quite honestly. And what those guys did were great. I loved what they did. I wasn't jealous because, oh, my songs didn't make it on the record. No, their songs were better. Right. And they did a hell of a lot more than I did. You know, I really just didn't have a knack until later in life, you know, that I even felt I had something to say or really some real something to offer. So, uh, yeah, did I contribute a little here and there? Sure. But not really, you know, where I had a volume of material until more recently, you know. So uh, that's just the way it worked out. So it, as you were saying that, and you mentioned the guys in the band, I'm sitting there and I'm, 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 I'm kind of laughing because, you know, here, here's, here's these clowns that were playing hair metal. So you got, and, and you can maybe get us up to speed on what, what Pete might be up to these days. But you got PJ, who we had Eric Martin on the show a month, month and a half ago, and he plays with Eric Martin quite a bit. And his name's come up a lot in different circles of people that we've talked to. Um, you have Steve that uh, every now and again, when uh, a band called Def Leppard uh, needs a guitar player, he's the guy that fills in. You got yourself, who's an entrepreneur, plus you're still putting out music. So it's kind of funny how a bunch of clowns are knocked on to do different things by world-class people. That just doesn't happen. It, you know, you guys had to be good. Well, I appreciate it. And yeah, uh, and you know, one thing that I think hurt us uh, more so in the past. The company that we were with attempted to capitalize on the youth factor. Right. And I think that hurt us to the sense that a lot of people didn't take us seriously. You right. know, maybe they didn't even give a music a chance or painted a light over what we were doing in a less serious sense, maybe, you know? But overall, as time went on and people actually saw, you know, particularly with Steve, the manner in which he plays guitar, uh, you know, it's undeniable. Son of a right. bitch is one of the best on the planet. You know, I, didn't, I think no one will dispute that. But he played like that 30 years ago also. Right. You know what I mean? So, again, I just think it took time for that to blossom. And we maybe even hindered ourselves with painting that whole youth thing or capitalizing on the youth thing. I think that actually really hurt us. Um, and nevertheless, uh, but yeah, you're making a point. Yeah, guys can play. Guys can sing. You know, and at the end of the day, write some songs, too. Oh, so, and you know, you don't get, just get a call just because you're in a, a popular band. Because you know the way it works, right? If you're out there and you're trying to get another gig, it's networking first. But at the end of the day, you might know people. If you sit in a room and you suck, um, <laughs> you're not getting the gig. Right? That's true. That's very true. Right? Very true. Very true. Yeah, we've been very fortunate. We really have, even outside the band, you know. And uh, you know, people call me to play. Call, call me to play a lot, you know. And uh, that's what I'm doing right now. I got some well, other things. You know, it's just, just, uh, Dave's got a question, but I, I did want to ask you about that. So how much are you playing? Like um, you and I are kind of, I'm guessing we're in the same age bracket. How much? I'm 53. Playing? Okay. So you're, you're, you're a year and change older than me, probably. Dang, yeah. um, but uh, you know, 
I certainly know that uh, the aches and pains of a gig are a lot more now than they were when I was 23. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm playing a lot. How much are you playing, you know, drums versus, are you, are you playing quite a bit? You still? I'm playing one? irregularly. I get fall into grooves where I'm doing a lot. Then I, if like, uh, if I'm working on another project, I kind of, I'm not, you know, I don't play much at all. I pick it back up a few months later and then kick it in the ass again, you know? So it is irregular. Uh, the, the toughest problem I have is just the uh, endurance as far as like playing a show, so to speak, when you're playing 10 songs full out. Yep. Uh, that's the first thing to go on me, you know? So I can't just take a month off or two months off and then say, hey, we got a show in three days. That's going to be a problem. I, that means I got to practice three days nonstop, sleep real good the night before, you know? But yeah, to build that back, that's what goes the most. Getting my licks back, no problem. I don't, I'm, I'm going to knock on wood. I uh, don't experience really aches and pains in that sense. Right. I'm trying to think, no, oh, well, if I don't warm up, if I don't exercise, if I don't get ready for a gig, that I did that once. And man, let me tell you something. I don't want to even say where I was. We were opening for a big show for Ted Nugent, and uh, I I, it was, I didn't exercise uh, like I should have for the few days prior, to, at minimum, you know, to to do the show. We were playing intermittently, you know, so uh, we had let's say three weeks off. Hey, we got a gig with Ted. Let's go. You know that sort of thing. So, and I was like, ah, I'll take, I'll make it no problem. By the fourth song, I couldn't raise my shoulder. I couldn't raise my arm. My shoulders were given out. Just yeah. muscle. It's like the kind of muscle you don't use all the time. That's right. And man, I was like, oh my God, I was praying for surrender, our ballad to come around just so I can get <laughs> back, you know, because I, I was dying. And I, I got so angry that that happened. And that was a later in life thing. I mean, you know, it's another thing where drummers, tend to have heart attacks and stuff like that because I truly believe that they're not in shape and they push themselves, you know, they use, they know, oh, I've done this a thousand times, but you haven't done a thousand times when you're over 50, yeah. you know, or, or whatever. And that's, you really got to watch your ass. And man, I'm telling you what, I felt a little something to that, not a heart attack, but I know what the body feels like when it's not ready to be pushed. Well, and sure. I let that happen once. And I never let it happen again. If I got a gig, man, I'm going to be ready for it. I'm going to kick it in the ass and not die and say, oh, my God, please, I hope I make it through. <laughs> you know? Well, and I, I was I was talking to a friend of mine today about the, the Rush documentary where they documented Neil Peart's last tour. And my favorite line that he had, I mean, you know, uh, such a such a great I mean, there's Neil Peart and everybody else in such a great mind and whatever. Um where he said, uh, you know, they're saying Charlie Watts can play and he's 70. Yes, Charlie Watts can play Charlie Watts parts when he's 70. Neil Peart cannot play Neil Peart parts when he's 63. So even a guy as great as that eventually recognized the fact that, hey, man, what we do is not a super easy thing to do, right? If you're not keeping up on it, you're going to be in tough. It's really true. It is a physical thing, and particularly in, you know, crazy rock, hair metal, whatever you want to call it, it's high energy. That's and right. when you got 20,000 people going crazy, I want to go crazy too. Yeah. And I don't want to sit back there and be that guy that just, oh, okay, I'm going to make it through the gig. Here we are. Thanks, folks. Bye bye. No, that, that's yeah. not the way I freaking yeah. play. Yeah. I mean, anybody who went to a Trisha show knows, you know, I, I hit those motherfuckers. <laughs> and I, I like hitting them real fucking hard. This is and what we I, did. You know, I, I, it's, it, it's emotion. It's not like, you know, I play somewhat dynamically, but, you know, particularly my fortissimo is super fucking fortissimo. So <laughs> and I don't want I don't want to play different, man. I don't want to yeah. take it easy. Well, I want to slam the shit out of them. I want you know, I, I love the reaction of the crowd when I do slam the shit out. You know, well, you're the guy playing 33,000 seater arenas. Right. So, I mean, you can't put on you can't, as my friend Sean says, mail it in. You're going to be 110 all the time. And it wasn't just about the musicianship back then. It was the show, how you looked, how you performed, how the lights, are, you know, how you interact with everybody. And it was jumping around. It was all that jazz. So you, you don't lose that. You still want to do it, but you can't do it maybe as much. Right. So, yeah, it, dude, it's the feeling, you know, when yeah, you're doing it, yeah. like if you're if you're just phoning it in. I mean, I've seen guys do it, man. You know, you can do that, but I can't. I, my personal constitution, I can't fucking do that. No. You know, I gotta give it all I got. I got I gotta do it. You know, the, I gotta give the music the best it could be. Also, you know, and man, let me tell you something. There's a difference. And look, I, I don't want to just pat my. Yeah, there's a difference between one drummer that plays like this and a drummer who's kicking it in the ass. 
Yeah, it is easily identifiable in a blindfold test. It's like, oh, you can tell which guy's kicking ass without looking at him. So yeah, when you are looking at him and he has, is kicking ass, it's going to make a visual dynamic difference. Well, and where, where we're at now, I got two things. Practice a lot and just for men, light brown. Like brown. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, brother. Yeah. I, 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 said, I go fuck dark it. brown sometimes. I said, fuck it. Can't, can't get rid of the uh, Kardashian swoosh, so it's, uh, it's now my trademark. <laughs> well, well, I'm wearing a hat. I'm not bald. I just like I like cowboy hats. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We're we're getting to break number two. But what I wanted to touch on earlier, because I kind of wanted to transition between maybe a trickster, the the longevity of the group while you were in it, how that thing kind of you know went by the wayside until the news of resurgence, and then what you did next. So that's kind of what I want to touch on next, if that's okay with you guys, is to find out like so. So tricksters, you know, you had a great run. Everything's going right. We know what happened. 90s came in. Napster came in. Shit happened. There's no more album sales. But I wanted to find out what you did after that and then transition to what you're doing now. Is that okay? Sure. Whatever you want, man. Let it fly. All right. Let's do a break first. Oh, I'm sorry. We can't talk about that. No, no, no. It'll be <laughs> over. <laughs> Whatever you want, babe. Let it fly. All right. So we'll take a break and we'll come right back. <laughs> 